right, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here tonight for this panel on Middle Eastern foreign policy. My name is Isabel Gouveia, and I am a sophomore here studying political science and journalism with a minor in international and global studies. I represent the American Enterprise Institute, a prominent public policy think tank in Washington, DC, on their executive council. Through this opportunity, it is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Michael Rubin and lecturer Thomas Kerr, who will take part in this conversation today. Dr. Rubin is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. A former Pentagon official, Dr. Rubin has lived in post-revolution Iran, Yemen, and both pre- and post-war Iraq. He has also spent time with the Taliban prior to 9-11. For more than a decade, he taught classes at sea about the Horn of Africa and Middle East conflicts, culture, and terrorism to deployed US Navy and Marine units. Dr. Rubin has a PhD and a master's in history from Yale University, where he also obtained a BS in biology. Tom Kerr is a lecturer of political science and policy studies and has been, been with Elon since 2019. Tom has earned bachelor degrees in political science and history from the Pennsylvania State University, a master's in international conflict revolution from Norwich University, a master's in political science from the University of California, North Carolina Chapel Hill, and is in the dissertation phase of his PhD at Sal Virginia University. Tom is a military veteran, having served eight years on active duty in the US Navy, first as a surface warfare officer, making two deployments to the Middle East, and second as an intelligence officer analyzing Lebanese Hezbollah, the Syrian Arab Republic, and the Russian Federation interests in the Levant. As an intelligence officer, Tom worked closely with America's other intelligence agencies and foreign partners, such as NATO allies and the Israeli Defense Force. Tom's research and teaching interests focus on international relations, transnational terrorism, and self-determination movements. I ask that you please hold questions until the end of the panel, where there will be a Q&A session. Following the panel, there will be a reception with appetizers and beverages. So without further ado, let's begin. Sure. All right, so we don't need microphones, right? No, I, I, let us know if you can't hear us, but I think we both can. Yeah. All right, great. So I think before we get into today's conversation, I think it's important to remind the audience of some of the most pressing policy issues that the U.S. government faces along with the Middle East. So I'm sure many are familiar with the Afghanistan withdrawal resulting in the Taliban's takeover, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and the Iran-Saudi proxy conflict. Can you both provide a little bit of a background for these, among others, that you think are crucial to discuss in today's conversation? Well, I'm going to default to the Iranian because I know that's your bread and butter. Um, so with the, I guess I'll go with the Afghan first. Uh, it is one of those things where the writing was on the wall for quite some time that we knew that the Taliban was going to be uh, an integral part on you know, post-American occupation in Afghanistan. We knew they were going to have to be a player. Uh, at what degree they were going to be, uh, that was still <coughs> up in the air. No one really foresaw the just precipitous takeover that happened uh, you know, in less than three weeks. It went from maybe a third of the country to near complete control. Uh, a lot of issues that are responsible for that. Um, American lack of institution building kind of in the region. Uh, the failure of the central Afghan government simply to pay its troops <laughs> is another one. Uh, the inability to create this sense of, I guess, nationalism within the, the Afghan military, where they weren't really beholden to Kabul. They, you know, they, it was a job for them. And that's not to say that there isn't a sense of it just being a job in the American military, but there's also that sense that you know, you're fighting for something greater. And that sense wasn't there. So when confronted with a lack of pay, a lack of equipment, and facing a very well-equipped and dedicated Taliban, the Afghan military just kind of withered away. Uh, so that's the, the big pressing issue. I guess the issue is where do we go from here? I mean, the fact on the ground is that the Taliban is in control. So we're going to have to work with them. Uh, however, distasteful that might be, we are going to have to deal with them if we want to have any sort of influence in that region. China's chomping at the bit when we get into Afghanistan. So if we want to maintain any semblance of 
influence there, we're just going to have to recognize the fact that the Taliban is who we're <coughs> So I think that's going to be a much more difficult domestic sale than it is on the foreign policy sale. But uh, yeah, I'll turn it over. If you want to okay. Um, I would just say briefly that presidential legacies are often defined by the issues that presidents didn't see coming when they were campaigning. That was certainly the case with George H.W. Bush, the elder Bush, uh, who campaigned as a domestic president and then was blindsided by the Iraqi invasion of, of Kuwait. Then, of course, Bill Clinton defeated uh, Bush with the tagline, it's the economy, stupid, and he was going to focus on the economy. And yet, then he got involved in the Balkans. George W. Bush campaigned as a domestic president and got involved after 9-11 in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so forth. Barack Obama said he was going to end stupid wars, quote unquote stupid wars. And not only did we remain in Iraq, despite his efforts to get out, and also in Afghanistan, but we found ourselves involved in Syria and Libya. So when I look at those issues which you brought forward, the question to me is, what might be the issue that we just don't see coming yet? And when it comes to Iran, I argue that perhaps the issue that will blindside Biden is transition in Iran. The fact of the matter is the Supreme Leader is 82 years old. He's had cancer. We know this because he tweeted out pictures of himself getting treatment. He's partially paralyzed from an earlier assassination attempt. And a lot of those uh, in his revolutionary circle have already died. So what happens should, should something happen to him? If we want to extend this further, Let's broadly, I mean, too often I'd say American foreign policy is calibrated to the status quo. And again, we get blindsided by what we don't see coming. If there's substantive change in the regime in Saudi Arabia or Jordan, what would that mean for US foreign policy? Can you imagine, given how much we rely on both those countries behind the scenes, if not up front, what it would mean if suddenly they were hostile regimes rather than complacent um, governments that wanted to partner with us? I'll be blunt, because in the think tank world, we are told to be blunt, bottom line up front. And then if you want me to back it up, I can back it up in the Q&A. But I would argue that the Israeli-Palestinian situation just doesn't matter. It might get gain a lot of passions within the United States and within the media. But it really doesn't matter that much. During the Arab Spring, the complaints which were being voiced weren't about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And then Donald Trump, even though I have, there's a lot to criticize about Donald Trump, the fact of the matter is he, he fucked conventional wisdom with his approach to the Arab-Israeli conflict, and it seems to have paid dividends. There's more, I mean, very few Arab countries now don't really have relations with Israel. Not all of them have official relations, but a lot of st states like Saudi Arabia and so forth have unofficial relations. It's a very, very few small number of countries that don't at all. With regard to Afghanistan, we might disagree and we can elucidate that in the Q&A. Um, but what I would simply say, when I look at Afghanistan, I think what might happen with regard to Pakistan. And some of you, have any of you ever read the book, The Mouse That Roared? It was also made into a Peter Sellers movie. But it's about um, the small European country the, the Grand Duchy of Penwick, or the Duchy of Grand Penwick, I forget what it's called, um, they're having an economic crisis, and they discover that every country that goes to war with the United States and loses gets bailed out. Japan, Germany, the Marshall Plan. And so they decide to declare war in the United States, and accidentally they win um, through a whole series of comedic events. And then they don't know what to do. Pakistan wanted to bloody the United States in Afghanistan. And I'm not sure whether their calculations extended to what happens once the Taliban have control. Every country that's used radical Islamism as a foreign policy tool, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, Libya, has ultimately faced blowback. So are we going to see that in Pakistan? Could we see Pakistan's collapse? So A, I'm not sure whether the Taliban truly are going to be able to consolidate lasting control in Afghanistan, because I think a lot of the neighbors are, are going to try to activate their own proxy militias again back to the future, back to the 1990s. But I'm much more concerned from an American policy perspective about what could happen if the Taliban, now that they have strategic depth in a safe haven in Afghanistan, 
decide to turn their guns the other way. I guess I'll take it from, you know, the question of you, Dr. Rubin, kind of stemming off what you just said. What does this mean on a U.S. foreign policy stand, uh, you know, standpoint? So we, the war on terror is over, technically. We withdrew our troops. What does that mean for the future of, you know, the U.S. military presence in the Middle East? What do you think? Will there be ever a military presence, prominent military presence in the U.S. again? And if so, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, you know, that's a great question. I, I mean, I never served uh, in the military, but I, over the last decade, I spent about a year on ships that were deployed. And one of the questions, most common questions I heard, and I'm sure you heard the same thing, is if you draw a circle around China and India on a world map, more people live inside that circle than outside that circle. And a lot, I mean, the United States doesn't get its energy from the Middle East. Um, we produce a lot of it ourselves. We get a lot of it from Brazil or in the past Venezuela and so forth. And so why are we protecting the energy security of, of China, for example? It was just a common question which servicemen had, and I'm, I'm sure you probably heard the same thing in your discussions. Um, that said, whenever we have tried to have a pivot away from the Middle East, the Middle East is a way of drawing us back. And there can be a, a, a serious difficulty when we give up the strategic geography um, that we utilize. We can have skeleton presence in places, but oftentimes we need those places for the logistics should we need to be able to fill a vacuum. Because when, when a vacuum develops, it's seldom the forces of altruism that fill it. It's seldom, um, I mean, Mother Teresa's of the world. It's more often the Islamic states, the Islamic republics of Iran, the Russians, the Chinas, and so forth. So within the Middle East, there may be a desire to pivot away, but um, we have to worry about being drawn back. Granted, one of the issues when I used to teach in the Navy um, that I would ask just as a thought question is when you looked at our strategic layout our infrastructure of where we have bases and so forth in the Middle East versus where we have them in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is no longer some placid area you just you just sail through. It's, it's hotly contested. The fact of the matter is we have a naval base in Suda Bay Creek, which we share with the, the Greeks. And that's about it. And yet I'd argue that what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean is much more important for us than oftentimes what happens in the Persian Gulf. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is when it comes to bases, do we need all the bases, but what could replace the bases? And this is where sometimes the devil's in the details, and I would defer to Tom's expertise, or Dr. Curry's expertise, I'm sorry. Can we just go to first names here? Yes, yes. Okay, My please, yes. thanks. Um, it's, it's just a lot easier, and unless you actually have an MD, I, I come from a family of veterinarians, and I'm always told that unless you can die, operate on a cat or dog. No, you're not a doctor. <laughs> I, I keep offering to try and they won't have me. Um, but the, the point is, um, when it comes to the nitty gritty of our defense budget and so forth and how we project power, I'd argue that our ability to have um, amphibious ready groups, basically LHGs, um, amphibious, basically you can think of them as small aircraft carriers that can fly helicopters or F-35s or uh, those Ospreys which take off like a helicopter and then fly like a plane, those are much more important perhaps than having bases. And in fact, it may not, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a sense out there which is incorrect, a stereotype that the Pentagon and the United States simply want to suck up bases and establish them wherever we can. But oftentimes, there's other factors which come into play. If you talk to any retired admiral, because retired admirals will often speak much more openly than people who are currently serving. And you, when I ask them a question as an Iran watcher, what is the strategic posture we should take if we want the Iranians to take our diplomacy seriously? To a man or a woman, they will say, get our aircraft carriers out of the Persian Gulf. And the reason for that is because the Persian Gulf is very narrow and it's very shallow. And to launch an aircraft off an aircraft carrier takes, what, 26 knots of wind speed. 
which means you either have to turn into the wind or hit the gas. And when you have all these islands and so forth in the Persian Gulf, which constrain international waters, it can be difficult to do. And then the Iranians swarm you with small boats. Before 1991, we didn't send carriers into the Persian Gulf. So you put them, our carriers 400, 500 miles outside the Indian Ocean, we can hit them, they can't hit us, suddenly they have to take us seriously. This is where sometimes military posture can amplify diplomatic posture. The point of this, however, is why do we continue to have our ships, our carriers, in the Gulf? And the reason for that is psychological. Remember, President Obama and now Biden talk about a pivot to Asia, and that's all well and good. There's a logic to that. But this isn't the first time that people in the Middle East have seen this rodeo. Back in 1968, the British decided against the backdrop of a financial crisis to also withdraw from the Gulf, to withdraw their navy from east of the Suez Canal. And that's when the United States got all these bases. But the question is, from the perspective of those in the region, we might talk about a pivot to Asia. What they hear is a pivot away from us. And then they, the question becomes, if the United States is abandoning us because they have this lived experience with the British, do we need to make accommodations with the Iranians, with the Chinese, with the Russians to fill this? And this is where it can, can get really complicated. So the question is, isn't just what military assets should we have in the Middle East, but psychologically, how do we convince our allies that we still have their back? Because a lot of, I mean, a military strategy is not just bombing. It's deterrence and containment as well. And it's very, very psychological. Let me, yeah. I, I don't know if you have yeah, expertise. Yeah, I, I want to build off on a little bit in that, as Michael was saying, we don't get our energy from the Middle East. I think it's 9% or something less than that. Japan gets 90% of their oil exports or imports from the Middle East. So it's how much do we want to be the guarantor of our allies? Same with you know, Western Europe. I mean, they don't have the Canada that they can just import all their gas from. So are we still going to be the guarantor of you know, Western Europe so they're not so heavily reliant on Russia? Are we going to be the guarantor of Japan, who is so inextricably tied to the Middle East oil? Um, what's our role in that? And also, how much are we willing to see to Russia to China in the Middle East? Are we willing to give up our sphere of influence there by, because as soon as we leave, they're going to move right in. So how much are we willing to allow that to happen? Are we going to try to contain China inside the you know, South China Sea, or are we going to allow them to start making inroads into other areas of operation? Um, again, the, the point with the, the carriers, yeah, I agree. No carrier should be in the Persian Gulf. It, it makes no sense other than it's a, it makes our allies feel good. It makes you know, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain feel good that we have one in there. Uh, we can accomplish the same thing in the Gulf of Oman rather than being right in there. Uh, small boys, you know, destroyers, frigates, uh, they can work the transit lane. We also need them in there just for the freedom of navigation, just to prove that we can. The small boys, not the The, the small boys, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, early work class destroyers are perfect. It's made for that sort of operation. So that's what we, we should be focusing on from a military strategy, but from a perspective aspect of things, those carriers are kind of powerful. Uh, if I could just bounce off something you said, when you're ta Tom, when you talked about Russia and China, one of my criticisms living in Washington and watching the foreign policy get made is when we conceive of our foreign policy, oftentimes we have the conceit that it's just us and our partners alone in the sandbox. But when it comes to Russia and China, a lot of people are critical, for example, of the Syrian support, uh, the Syrian use of chemical weapons against civilians. And I, I, I'd hazard to guess that perhaps we can have bipartisan consensus that using chemical weapons against civilians is bad. But, one of the few things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, imagine, I mean, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt, is a dictator. 
make no mistake of that, or Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. We talk about the crown prince so much because King Salman has Alzheimer's disease, and therefore it's really the crown prince who's calling the day-to-day -day shots, just as an explainer. But we can criticize both their human rights practices. I can also hazard to guess that in a bipartisan way, one of the other things we can agree on is it's bad to chop up journalists and dissolve them and ask them. I would hope we can agree on that. But while we focus on expressing our human rights anger towards regimes like Saudi Arabia's or Egypt's, we have to have in the back of our mind the fact that the Russians are going to President Sisi and say, look at the Americans and the crap they're giving you. You know, we stand by our allies no matter what they do. You can even use chemical weapons and we're going to stand by you. So one of the problems we have to address when it comes to Russia and China is how do we push forward our own um, ideas of democracy, social transformation, human rights, while at the same time not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Because while some progressives might want to cut off Mohammed bin Salman completely because of what he did uh, with regard to um, the journalist, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, at the same time, is that really going to improve the human rights situation in the kingdom if he simply pivots and has China as his primary patron instead of us? So it's just one of those other issues beyond the military which we need to look at in the region. And I'll, I'll be the first to say, and I think many of my colleagues at AI believe the same thing, we're not so arrogant enough to believe that we have a magic formula. If a magic formula existed in policy, these problems would have been solved a while ago. The fact of the matter is they aren't solved. And what I would further say is when you look at the average age of policymakers, uh, either in Congress with congressional staff or manning the desks at the Pentagon and so forth, or I mean, running intelligence shops or the pilots who are at the front, um, front end of protecting democracy in the Navy, the fact of the matter is they're in their 20s. They're extremely young. And therefore, the debates, I mean, there's no reason why you guys can't contribute to these debates which haven't been resolved. I would just put that out there. I'd love to put it back. Um, I'm assuming a lot of questions will be, you know, surfaced around the U.S. withdrawal in Afghanistan. It's something that's clearly been a huge foreign policy issue in the past couple of months. Um, I remember Corey Shockey, a colleague of yours. She's also a senior fellow at AAI, for those of you who aren't familiar. But Corey and I had a conversation, and she was telling me how um, Biden, Biden specifically, and also the Biden administration, they kind of assumed that it was going to take six to eight months after, sorry, after the withdrawal for any sort of um, Taliban takeover against the Afghan government. It took 11 days, as we know. Um, so I guess my, my question to you, and, and please feel free to elab elaborate on this and, and kind of expand on it, but what would you say, if we hadn't withdrawn, would that have made a significant difference? Would we have held out for a prolonged period of time, or do you think really the Taliban would have taken over, essentially? I think the forces that we had in there, I think what we were at, 1,200 yeah. at the very end there, if that, um, they were a tripwire. They were preventing the Taliban from going into the major population centers. Um, they were, <clears throat> one of the reasons why they, they worked so well is because we started to hang back on our close-in air support. Uh, as soon as they knew that was completely gone, then they were able to um, make you know, the full frontal assaults that they were able to do. Uh, so I think the status quo would have been maintained, even with that skeleton crew that we had in that cancer. So loss of life was almost non-existent for Americans up until the actual withdrawal. So the fact that we withdrew completely at all was a strategic mistake. Uh, I think once we were in there, once we had boots on the ground, we would have to keep boots on the ground. Even at that, you know, very minimal amount of force, that was what was holding things together. Uh, just not even the use of our close-in air support, but the threat of our close-in air support was keeping the Taliban relatively at bay. 
they were, again, going to be a part of the government. They were powerful enough, that, you know, just facts on the ground, they were a player, and we had to recognize that. But having them sweep in and take a pool, that would not have occurred if we would have maintained that, that skeleton force. Um, we agree on a lot. We could argue a little bit about the inevitability of the Taliban becoming part of the government. Um, what I would say, one of the things we need to address is that there was an intelligence failure. It's not as if the Taliban simply rose up and steamrolled through, although traditionally in Afghanistan, instead of having front on battles, you often have issues of momentum that people will show up and if the other guys have the bigger guns, then they will leave. You have defections and political deals being cut, and this is what happened. The Taliban had, for over a year, pre-positioned people to start making these political deals, and a lot of the Taliban steamrolling through into the country was political deal-making rather than actual battles. And the fact that we did not detect that, to me, represents an intelligence failure, perhaps more <coughs> than the fact that we um, had retrenched ourselves in a few bases and a few cities and didn't really have the ability to determine what was going on in Fada or in Nimruz or in some of the other um, provinces. The Taliban, again, did this very strategically. They, one of the first things they did was cut off the north of the country because between 1996 and 2001, that's how the Northern Alliance got supplied and that's why the Taliban the first time around were never fully able to consolidate control over the country. Um, it's an open question whether they're going to be able to hold the North. I was actually at doing a conference online with UN security officials in Tashkent this morning, trying to figure out some of the stuff with the northern border of Afghanistan, so it was the topic of, uh, of discussion there. Um, one of the things we found out in the think tank community, um, and I don't mean just the Washington think tank community, but also the Indian think tank community as well, is when you actually look at on, online jihadi forums and so forth, we've counted at least 1,500 Pakistanis that died over the summer fighting in Afghanistan, mostly in July and August, um, sometimes commanding units. And so this has led some Afghans to suggest that this was more of an invasion than a successful insurgency. Um, and sometimes those Pakistanis not sometimes, there were oftentimes, their bodies were returned within two days to be buried in their home villages anywhere over, I mean, all across Pakistan, which suggests some, some systems going back and forth there. And again, that seems to be something that to some extent we missed or at least didn't want to address. One of the things I'm most concerned about is with this simplistic rhetoric of forever wars. What I, I agree with Trump that if we had not given a timeline and announced our withdrawal, and then completed our withdrawal, not only do I not think that the Taliban would be in Kabul, I don't think they would be in any provincial capital right now. The tripwire issue is the basis of strategy, and if you don't know what tripwire is, it just means having an American troop presence somewhere to make enemies think twice about what they might want to do or what they can do without having consequences. But when we talk about forever war, to me, that's just renaming traditional deterrence and containment. I mean, are we engaged in a forever war in Korea? Technically, we're still at war then. Or in Japan, or in Korea. The fact of Ger Germany. The fact of the matter is that there were fewer people that died in car accidents in this county than died American servicemen who died in the last five years up to that su horrific suicide bombing at the airport. We've finally gotten the formula right. I think where we went wrong in Afghanistan and frankly in Iraq as well was in the nation building component of what we were doing as opposed to the traditional containment and deterrence amplification factors. We were spending, I mean, our mission in Afghanistan over the last five years didn't cost significantly more than our missions in Korea and Japan. Now, people can complain about the quality of Afghanistan's government and whether that opened the door for the Taliban. Ashraf Ghani was corrupt. But if you go back and look at the history of, of the Korean War, Sigmund Rhee, the first pre I mean the, the president of South Korea, 
was hopelessly corrupt. And South Korea also had spasms of dictatorship during the slow evolution to, to democracy. But the fact that we stood with it, you can see the juxtaposition between North Korea and South Korea today. Now, if you, any of you ever go down to Key West, Florida, I urge you to go into the Truman White House, his resort where he spent a lot of time working after he had had his heart attack, because the criticisms which you have of Truman in the Korean War mirror the criticisms which you had um, of Bush towards Afghanistan and some of his successors, open-ended conflict, people aren't capable of democracy culturally in this area and so forth. It's actually quite stunning, the parallels. The, now, when it comes to the Taliban being part of the government, I would argue the Taliban isn't all that popular, that if they were, they wouldn't hesitate to go to elections. Fundamentally, the reason why I don't think that they could be part of a government is the difference between the Taliban and the other government, which is technically an Islamic Republic, is that the Islamic Republic wanted, um, I mean, had a president who was elected. It had Islam, I mean, the official language, was, um, the official religion was, was Islam and so forth. The constitution was based on Sharia, but it had an elected president. What the Taliban wanted is an Islamic emirate, in which you have an unelected religious figure who dictates he's selected by an unelected religious council. How do you square that circle? And I took part in a number of conferences, non-governmental conferences, in Afghanistan and Herat and other places where people tried to argue this through. And there were some ideas of having one country, two systems. But there was a belief that the Taliban wouldn't abide by those agreements either. So I'm not sure whether it was ever possible to have a broad-based coalition government. I would also argue, and this is a broader issue, not just in Afghanistan, our knee-jerk diplomatic reaction in Somalia, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, is always to have a big coalition broad-based government. But can you imagine Dick Cheney and Hillary Clinton sharing an office? How well would that work? Sometimes what we need is to have foment a responsible opposition, rather than trying to get everyone into the same big tent, because those governments, I hate to say, simply don't work. I guess I want to copy up when I said a part of the government was talking about talking. I don't think at any point the central government of Kabul was going to be able to exercise sovereignty on all, all areas of Afghanistan. That just, they didn't have the capability to do that. So we would have to recognize that in pockets that are, I'm going to say sympathetic, because I agree, the vast majority of Afghans don't necessarily like the Taliban. Um, but they did have pockets of control that we have to realize that that was kind of the fact on the ground. So we have to work with them in that. I didn't, I didn't want to make it seem like they were going to have representatives in the legislature. I misspoke. I don't know. I agree with you completely. Although I think there were some people, especially in New York and so forth, who had this vision, and it's a traditional problem, especially in New York, especially with the UN, of trying to transcribe what looks good in the boardroom into a country further afield. Yes. Would you two agree that, um, this is a little bit of a side joke, but would you two agree that many, you know, Afghani soldiers, when this was all going on, they knew that they weren't going to be getting this U.S. support anymore. Do you think that, you know, the Taliban might have kind of come in and persuaded them almost and said, you know, here, we will, we're not going to kill you, maybe we'll provide, you know, finances, food for your families if you come and join us. Do you think that might have been a... What was the average rate, like 152 yeah. bucks? They would come in and say, hey, turn in your weapons to us. We'll give you 152 bucks. Go home. There's also a social factor that, um, I mean, we want to believe that we have won people's hearts and minds. Oftentimes in the region, this is also true in Iraq, people were more pragmatic. So if you're a father with two sons, you send one to join the Afghan National Security Force. You send the other to join the Taliban so that if you ever get stuck at a checkpoint, you have the wasta to be able to call one side or the other or to have your family extricate itself. So there's a lot of pragmatic calculation survivalism going on that has nothing to do. And one of the questions I have moving forward is while you have the Taliban and there's some in Washington who have the conceit that we can partner with the Taliban against the Islamic State of Khorasan or Al Qaeda, I would suspect that the same pattern will go on now where you're going to have those two farmer sons one of whom is going to join the Islamic State, another one's going to be with the Taliban, 
just in order to ensure that that family survives. All right, so before we move into some Q&A, we've got time for one more question. Um, I guess just to wrap things up, you know, I know you both touched a little bit on this, but what do you see for, you know, the future of, of the Middle East in, in, I guess, in general? I mean, I know it kind of varies country to country. I know, you know, we're dealing with dictators, we're dealing with several failed states, but what do you see, I guess, in an overarching light of, of the future of the Middle East and, and the U.S. presence in the Middle East? Do you think we'll remain allies with several countries? Do you think we will, you know, they'll become our enemies? What do you kind of gauge from, from your expertise in the areas? It's kind of a boring answer, but <laughs> status quo. Mm. Uh, I don't see much change. Okay. Um, I think the inherent interests are there. Uh, we brought those up. Uh, so the United States is never going to completely extradite itself from the, the region. Uh, I think there's enough interest from the, I want to call them Halati partners in the region that right now we're the best option to deal with. Uh, we have a great incentive to make sure that we are still the best option to deal with. Uh, so unless we shoot ourselves in the foot and start to retreat back and cede that control to one of the other, probably Russia would like to, I don't know if they have the capabilities, their finances are still really hurting, but China most definitely would love to be able to, and we've seen that, I mean, they, they're starting to base ships out of Djibouti. They're trying to get into that region. So, uh, status quo, probably the best thing to go for. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I, I largely agree with that. Um, I would argue that just, again, as a historian, and that means I just get paid to predict the past, and my critics would say I only get that right about half the time. Um, but when Napoleon invaded Egypt in, 19, in 1798, um, it really was a shock to the system. And a lot of the intellectual movements in the region can be traced to this. Why is it that we always considered ourselves superior to the West? Um, I mean. Muhammad was, was the cap of the prophets, the last one. Uh, we should be the folks in power. And suddenly, the West is so much more technologically advanced. And the modernist debate basically came down into two camps. One was, if you can't beat them, join them. We have to learn what the West did and adopt to that. And the other is that um, perhaps we're not being Islamic enough, whatever that means. And so this led to some of the radical movements uh, which have evolved to what we see today. Now, where I'm going with this is, I, I mean, again, by my academic training as an Iranian historian back in the first decade of the 20th century, Iran saw itself as on par with Japan. They were obsessed with Japan, especially after Japan defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. And when I lived in Iran, People would often say that, I, I mean, in the 1990s, that you know we were like a South European country, and yet today, 17 years, 19 years after the revolution, I mean, Southern Europe has just left us in the dust. What I worry about moving forward is whether there could be another symbolic Napoleon in Egypt sort of moment when Sub-Saharan Africa overtakes the Middle East when it comes to the economy. Um, because the Middle East has done a great deal with regard on the back of the petrodollar. I'm not worried about American fracking disrupting this. I'm worried about Chinese fracking. And this could truly undercut the base of the Middle East economy. Now, some states, like the United Arab Emirates, are doing a great job of trying to diversify their economy. Other states are heading to failure, like Egypt where the military just can't get out. When I talk to Moroccans, everyone always talks about the education crisis in Morocco. Um, and whether they educate enough school teachers in order to provide enough jobs uh, in the textile industry or in farming or so forth. But why should we think that the Middle East is going to be immune from the economic winds which we see elsewhere in the world when it comes to automation? I mean, why do we think that these countries like Egypt or Morocco or Yemen are going to be able to do high manpower intensive industries and not have to deal with automation. 
And so the question is, what are we doing to prepare these students for 30 years from now rather than from 10 year, for 10 years ago? And unfortunately, I think this is going to lead to some problems, although I do largely agree with Tom that we're heading as far as the United States is concerned to just to continue to status quo. Thank you both. I really appreciate your insight. Um, do you have any questions on the floor? Okay. Just introduce yourself as you ask it. Yes. Maybe your um, name and then. Like what you're yeah, studying? Yeah, sure. What you're studying and, and year of graduation. Laura. Um, so I'm Lauren Broughton. I'm a sophomore. I'm studying political science. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research on tourism in the Middle East, and obviously that greatly impacts the economy because tourism is pretty much everywhere except Africa and the Middle East, and that does affect their economy. Do you think with not necessarily the Taliban, but I guess the world itself modernizing and like women and government and all that stuff, do you think, do you see a future of tourism in the Middle East, or do you think that with like the near future, or do you just see it not helping at all the economy? Yes, that's either I would say um, many of the countries are trying to figure this out. Saudi Arabia, I, I talked to the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, and they had just had a trip to Saudi Arabia. And on one hand, Saudi Arabia opened up for tourism. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia, still being an autocracy, refused to allow the drivers to have GPS. And so the drivers for the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia tour, the local drivers, the, the, the tourists actually had to help the drivers figure out where different things were because the drivers, because of the restrictions within Saudi Arabia, weren't able to do it. I mean, the, the whole system of opening up can be clunky, especially when tourists don't necessarily behave well, and this has happened with the Israelis going to Dubai and so forth. What I would say, however, if I could just twist the question a little bit, one of the it, where places where I think we go wrong is there's, there's a, a sense within the development and aid community that the way forward in supporting these countries and their economies is to support small businesses um, and family-owned businesses. I would argue that's wrong, that the way to move forward in the region is to support multinationals. And my logic for this is if you're a small business, you hire a few people, but you, you can't really hire someone from the street who's going to be promoted to take over your family business unless they're in the family. But if you have an IBM, for example, then you have not, I mean, you can sort of hire people and train them so that they can socially transform themselves moving forward. At the same time, without even trying, you then have the restaurants spring up surrounding, which are the small businesses. So in a way, you do get, a, even though it's a loaded term, a trickle down. And I do think if we try to adjust some of our strategy within the region, I've seen this work in Somaliland. Uh, where Dubai World came in and suddenly Berbera is thriving. And the fact of the matter is, um, tourism is part of that, but I think we can go much more broadly into um, the service economy, which comes from supporting a, um, a better economic infrastructure in the region. Tom, anything to add? Who All right. Yeah, hey, I'm Jack Sussler. I'm a senior. I study economics and environmental sustainability. Um, and you had a comment earlier saying that the issue in Israel is rather irrelevant to the United States. And it's to, the, I totally agree. to the region, I would say. Um, yeah, I was yeah. hoping for you to elaborate on that because you kind of brushed over it earlier. Um, and maybe speak about its relevance to the U.S. Okay, um, well, very briefly. Yeah. Um, when I live when it comes to the fervency of views critical of Israel, they are very high in the Palestinian territories, and they're very high in the frontline states with Israel. Every Israeli of a certain generation knows someone that was, or had someone in their family that was killed in the war with frontline Arab states, and ditto with the Arab states. But when I'm in Iraq, most Iraqis know someone who died in the war with the Iranians, or vice versa. They don't know anyone that fought with Israel. So if you ask them what, whether they're sympathetic to Israel or the Palestinians, they're going to be more sympathetic to the Palestinians. If you ask them whether they truly care, the answer is no. And then likewise with the Arab Spring, people were thinking about their own pocketbook, their own wallet. 
I mean, what about their own lack of ability to um, have upward mobility? And that has, uh, that has everything to do with the corruption and the autocracy of regimes and very little to do about, um, about Israel. Now, there is long a debate. I mean, one of the problems I would argue is moral hazard. Initially, and, and this the Trump administration brought forward, but I'm not doing this to cite Trump. Um, I, I find it extremely disturbing that the United Nations has a definition of, re of refugee for the rest of the world and then a separate definition of refugee for the Palestinians. If you look at the United Nations Refugee Works uh, Administration, UNRWA, it was supposed to go out of business in 1951. And it was kept going into perpetuity where someone who is the son um, or the grandson or the great-grandson of a refugee had that refugee status that's not the case in the rest of the world. Likewise, if you live anywhere in the West Bank or Gaza Strip, technically you can't be a refugee um, by the more international definition. You're an internally displaced person. And we have that everywhere else around the world. One of the things that concerns me is when it comes to international aid for uh, Palestinian refugees, that it can actually undermine again, the moral hazard, can undermine their ability um, to have their governments act in a beneficial way for Palestinian society. If in Gaza specifically, um, the Palestinian Authority knows, or no, I'm sorry, the, the local authority, the Hamas Authority, knows that no matter what happens, the world is going to come in and rebuild electrical plants, um, houses, um, water systems, and so forth, money being fungible, then they can focus all their efforts on war and aggression. Whereas if they are held accountable and they guide their government to, to a disaster, then ultimately I would argue that the way forward would be to allow local Palestinians to throw them out rather than bail them, have the international community bail them out. And I think this is where we're going wrong, it may be controversial, but I can back it up by looking at Somalia versus Somali land, by looking at issues with regard to capacity and development aid elsewhere as well. That was a very insightful one. Lily? Really? I have a follow-up question to that. Um, you said earlier about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict comment that it doesn't really matter that much. Do you think that the reason that there's so much that it seems to matter so much is lobbyist organizations impact, or would you say more so just the prevalence of the Jewish diaspora in the US? So what are those factors coming from if, if you're a consumer of the media and you think it matters so much? Um, I would say, quite simply, Judaism and Christianity, it's not just in the United States. It's not because of any um, particular um, organization here, because God knows there's organizations on both sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm but it's rather simply because of the interest of Jerusalem as being a holy site for both Jews and Christians, and for that matter, for Muslims as well, um, Haifa for Baha'is, if you want to go further. Um, that is the issue. But historically, I mean, if you want to go much further back, Palestine, and I use this in the historic sense, um, was always backwater. In fact, when you look at Islamic history, you had, of course, the Rashidun, the right Gaidic Caliphs. And then from, what was it, 1681 to 750, you had the Umayyad dynasty, and then, which was based in Damascus and it was an Arab. And then you had the Abbasid Caliphate, which lasted up until 1258 when the Mongols sacked the city. By the way, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, when the Mongol delegation came in with t-shirts bragging about their second deployment to Baghdad, it didn't really go well. <laughs> but um, the fact of the matter is, that if you look at what's considered the apex of Islamic civilizations, um, civilization, the gunpowder empires, you had Safavid Persia, you had Mughal India, and you had the Ottoman Empire. These were all non-Arab empires. And maybe this is someone who's been schooled in Iranian history talking, but this is one of the reasons, I mean, even in early Islam, has had the evolution of the center of Islamdom move eastward. You had non-Arabs 
take over sort of the bureaucracy. The old Persian priestly class became the new religious class, and so forth. Now, the point of this is, um, even during the Crusades, we might look at the Crusades front and center. But historically, if you look at literature, Islamic literature from the time, if people weren't, I mean, within Islam, they weren't, I mean, Palestine, these were, the Crusaders were like fleas fighting at their heels. What were they concerned about at the time? Do you have, I mean, what they were concerned about were the hordes of refugees which were being pushed westward by what would become the Mongols, by Genghis Khan, which ultimately would lead to the, the collapse of the Abbas Caliphate back in 1258. The point of this is it was only with oil that, again, the Arab world became truly important. And so there's sort of a schizophrenia within policy circles. You have the religious aspect, but you also have the tendency in the United States and Europe to take our own lived experience and push it backwards artificially in time, um, which creates sort of a warped view of the region, and frankly, one which many people in the region don't necessarily share. That doesn't mean that they're not sympathetic to the Palestinians. There's a very real dispute there. All I'm saying is that, that you're a Kurd fighting Saddam Hussein or fighting Bashar al-Assad, or if you are um, pick, pick a minority anywhere in the region, then perhaps the Palestinians aren't your first concern. Thank you. Uh, oh. Sorry, my name's Jackson. I'm a senior uh, studying engineering and international relations. Um, I want to say that was an interesting response. I got like, I don't really know anything about world history after like 1200 and before like 1700 or something. So that probably explains it. There's probably a lot going on in the Middle East. But my question was, uh, you mentioned Ali Khamenei uh, as like Iran's prime leader, and that he's getting very old. Uh, uh, do you? See foresee after this U.S. exit, uh, like a democratic election taking place in Iran or potentially Afghanistan or maybe Saudi Arabia, and were an election to take place, do you think that like Russia, China, and India, the United States, and other non-Arab forces would uh, sort of maintain control of the government, or do you think control would actually end up being internally? I think there's real aspiration for democracy. I don't see it happening. Um, period. I mean, the Iranians have their own indigenous experience with democracy. The so-called Constitutional Revolution in 1905, 1906, which finally petered out by around 1911. But instead of looking at democracy as a foreign implant, they can actually say, "Look, we just want to get back to our past." That said, um, the problem is power dynamics. I would expect what you're going to have when Khamenei dies. But by, by the way, when Sultan Qaboos died in Oman. It was constitutionally written that within two days, there had to be a new sultan. And there were all sorts of ways to choose that sultan. In Iran, technically, you have a system in which the assembly of experts will choose the new supreme leader. We know from the previous transition, back in June 1989, that they tend to be a rubber stamp body after you have a lot of other negotiations behind the scenes. But what the Omanis and the Bahrainis have pointed out to me is that nowhere in the Iranian constitution does it say when the assembly of experts chooses. And so you could actually have groups like the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps simply push forward to prevent a new supreme leader from being chosen. Or you could have, um, there's nothing in the Iranian constitution or Khomeini's philosophy that says the supreme leader has to be a single person. Maybe it's a council, and then you have another dynamic. I would expect that you're going to have the military rush to the center to try to secure things. And then you could have Saudi Arabia and other countries interfere along the periphery, as has happened in the past. And so this is why I said at the beginning that all too often we gear US policy to what the status quo is, rather than think about what could change in the very near future. But also, I've been monopolizing the answers to these questions. Uh, especially when it comes to Arab-Israeli situation. You have a better expert than me here, so I want to turn the floor back to you. Um, <laughs> I, I think when it comes to Iran, as Michael was saying, uh, when Khamenei dies, elections aren't going to happen. You know, 
if you go on social media and you look at uh, your generation of Iranians, yes, they would love that. You know, they do their social media. They're very cosmopolitan. They're, they're looking to Western it's more progressive. Very much so. Very much so. Um, but the paradigm dynamics, as Michael was saying, they just aren't there. Uh, the, with the <coughs> IRGC having such an influence that they won't allow that to happen. So, though probably the majority of Iranians, or at least majority of Iranians under 45 would want that, uh, I would say it's not going to happen. Same with Saudi Arabia. There's not going to be elections in Saudi Arabia. Won't be elections in Jordan. Won't be elections in Oman. It's just not going to happen within probably my lifetime. <laughs> if I may, there's an old Iranian joke about an Iranian woman who's getting married. And on her wedding night, she tells her husband, I'm sorry, I probably should have told you this, but this is my second marriage. And the husband goes, What? And she says, No, 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 don't worry, I'm still a virgin. Says, this is where everyone gets nervous at the joke I'm about to tell. Um, and, and she was like, no, 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 don't worry, I'm still a virgin. The husband goes, how can that be? She said, well, my first husband was like Hassan Rouhani, the, until recently the president of Iran. He kept promising to do it, promising to do it, promising to do it, but ultimately he didn't touch a thing. The point of this is that you have a sense among Iranians of apathy. Because the last time they had a revolution, what Khomeini promised was an Islamic democracy. And what they got was neither. And, but they got a war that killed a million people. And so when you do talk to Iranians, yes, they might aspire to democracy, but they're also very, very nervous about pulling that trigger. We've actually done telephone surveys where you, and Iranians culturally are much more willing to talk than uh, Arabs, Pakistanis, Afghans, and so forth talk openly and honestly, and especially about economic issues. And when you take every telephone exchange in Tehran, like the first three digits of the phone number, you randomize the last four digits so that you get a good cross-section of the neighborhoods, including those where Western reporters seldom go, and you ask them economic questions, and then you do the data crunching, what you find are 10% of Iranians truly believe in the Islamic Republic. Everything is going swell. Another 15% think that what Khomeini, the Khomeini's revolution back in 1979 was a good thing, but it's been misapplied and it needs to be reformed. These are the so-called glasnost, it's like glasnost or proestroika. And the 70, other 75% have completely given up on the system, but again, they're not revolutionaries. This gentleman's had his hand up for a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, cool. So yeah, my name's Nancy Longin, sophomore, uh, double major marketing in computer science. So I just had two questions, basically. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys mentioned that like with the Taliban, they want to like uh, reimpose strict Islamic rule in Afghanistan, and how they're they did it through force, so like without elections, so obviously that their campaign is unpopular. So do you see uh, a civil war breaking out between like the anti-Taliban and the Taliban, and if so, would the U.S. intervene in the war? Okay, to answer that first question, I think it's a possibility. And remember, just as quickly as the Afghan forces fell this past August, so too did the Taliban fall back in October of 2001 when they were confronted with a great deal more force. But one issue to understand with regards to the Taliban and their concept of Islamic law, first of all, when people talk about Sharia and Islamic law, it's like talking about state law in the United States without ever defining what state you're in because there's no single codified source of Islamic law. So the Taliban have a very, very narrow vision. But there's also a cultural thing going on. The best, at the risk of, is anyone here from West Virginia? OK, because at the risk of, uh, of putting my foot in my mouth, if you want to understand the way the Taliban are, especially towards cosmopolitan cities like Kabul, imagine that some guys from the backwoods of West Virginia take over Berkeley, California. They're going to treat the people in Berkeley, California, as they try to impose their order with a lot more strictness than people in the backwoods of West Virginia. So when I was in the Taliban-controlled areas, and this was the first time around, I mean, I would see real violence in Kabul directed towards women. And yet, then if I were in the countryside, 
I see women working in the fields, not covering their, not fully veiled, because the Taliban weren't worried about the countryside people so much. They were worried about this urban cosmopolitan culture, which they saw as a little bit too liberal, a little bit too pro-Western. So you have this dynamic of the countryside versus the city also playing out. And it's not just the Taliban. This was part of what also drove the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, this anti-urbanization, this distrust of the intellectuals. And so you have that dynamic coming into play as well. But yes, I, I could see, I don't think Afghanistan has a stable, let me put it this way, there's an old Russian joke about um, and the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. And the Russian pessimist is the one who said, you know, things have never been so bad. War, violence, starvation, they couldn't possibly get worse. And the Russian optimist is the one who says, no, 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 they can always get worse. So in this case, in answer to your question, I'm going to be an optimist. Can I go off on that, too? I was really surprised that during you know, August when all of this was happening, estimates on Taliban strength, 110 maybe at most fighters out of a country of 36 million? 110,000 or 110,000 fighters. Just shoot numbers. I mean, <laughs> why? There was plenty of arms, there was plenty of ability to fight back, and it just didn't happen. So if during that time frame, when <coughs> at the, the best opportunity to fight back, to prevent the Taliban takeover from occurring, if the vast majority of people didn't do it then, I don't know if they're going to do it now or in the future. So the idea of the Civil War being large scale, I'm not so sure of. I think there's going to be regional fighting as well as the low intensity conflict. I think it's just going to be a simmering conflict um, throughout. We have red mass. You had a question. Yeah. Hey, I'm the doctor um, first year. <coughs> I'll be sending <coughs> political science and international global studies. Um, I want to go back to a point you made, Professor Kerr, of how if the U.S. wants to retain influence out against that we're going to have to work with the um, obviously acting as the government as of right now. There's been a lot of talk about their international recognition. Um, so do you see the United Nations recognizing the Taliban um, as, as the legitimate um, state, um, or will they act as a free state? I don't think they're going to be recognized as such. Uh, they're not going to be granted the Afghan seat in the general assembly. I don't think that's happening. When I'm saying work with the Taliban, um, I'm saying that there are issues that are need to take place. There are issues that we need to address. We need to work with them. Otherwise, other states are going to. I mean, China's already wanting to do uh, rare mineral excavation in Afghanistan. So, they're going to put in the economic aspects of things. I think simply unfreezing some of the funds, because right now the top one is absolutely strapped for cash. So just allowing them that amount of money would allow them to at least operate, and if nothing else, just for the altruistic reason of allowing public services to occur within the country. Um, but. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no I, I just want to highlight, this is where we can agree to disagree, but what, what you bring forward is a much more important issue that's not just limited to Afghanistan. One of the debates out there with regard to Syria right now is whether the United Nations, in terms of, and the international community more broadly, in terms of um, humanitarian aid, in terms of reconstruction, should work through the Syrian government, or whether that would ultimately reward the Syrian government for having abused and um, human rights and destroyed their country in the first place. Again, this is one of those nitty gritty things for which there is no magic solution. Um, Tom and I may disagree on the policy prescriptions with regard to the Taliban, I, I think we certainly do, but when it comes to figuring out how you can make your mark on the debate, 
outside of a law and university. This type of issue is how do you work with bad actors in terms of what sort of humanitarian incentive um, in exception should there be and how to control that so that you're not rewarding bad actors is one of those things that could really you, you use some deep thought, uh, perhaps in a student paper and then later in an article. Hi, Chase. Um, oh, nice. I'm a sophomore. I study mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. science and economics. Um, and I was trying to let you go back to your um, collapse of Afghanistan um, discussion. Um, and I think a lot of voices in the news and politicians in the news, for whatever which reason, um, like to just stick to talking about the military aspect of it and the foreign policy aspect of it. And then um, others who kind of dive deeper into it, um, look at it from an intelligence community aspect. Do you think it's worth noting, um, maybe there's just a sheer lack of understanding of how Afghanistan has worked historically and culturally for different like, tribal relations? I know you talked about different political deals um, throughout the country and how this works, maybe el religious elders in different sectors and different villages and tribes. Do you think if we maybe understood that concept, if we understood that concept more, we might be a little better to, um, I guess, tackle the issue of Afghanistan? There's, there's a difference between understanding how those dynamics work and being able to influence those dynamics. Uh, being able to place operatives on the ground, whether it be non-governmental, military, clandestine, even if they understand those dynamics, being accepted enough by the local communities to be able to influence their behavior is another matter. So, yes, there is a lack of understanding. There, there was a lack of foresight. There was some serious intelligence gaps. But even with that better understanding, I'm not quite sure how we would have been able to better work on the ground with those you know, smaller sized entities. As you know, the United States government, we would have to work probably at the greatest level, provincial, maybe city, would be as low down as we could go and still have any sort of influence. I'll, I'll add to that. I think it's a great question and one that's often heard. Um, but I, I think it's a simplistic notion that that knowledge is lacking there. I mean, if you look at Peter Thompson's books, The Wars of Afghanistan, he was slated to be the, um, the ambassador to Afghanistan in the 80s. He was on the John Stewart show. Um, his book is like 1,000 or 1,500 pages long, all about the internal tribal dynamics. And you know he was he's pretty much right about everything. Um, I don't think that's an issue. First of all, the past isn't always precedent. Afghanistan has changed over time. So just because in the past there's been tribalism or these dynamics, doesn't mean that society itself doesn't evolve. Afghanistan today isn't what it was in the um, 1960s, isn't what it was in the 1860s, and so forth. One of the things I, one of the concerns I have is that where I think we go wrong is twofold. First of all, every American administration um, comes in thinking that we have a tabula rasa to start with policy. Um, that we don't, and that there's also a conceit that whenever we make a mistake, there's a way to overcome that mistake. If you're driving a car off a cliff, when you're halfway down the precipice, this isn't the time to say, maybe I should try something else. Um, so you have that issue. More broadly, um, where I think we were weak in Afghanistan isn't just intelligence, but more broadly is language. And this is something that we can go back to Kissinger. Back in um, the set, early 70s, Kissinger decided when it came to um, the State Department and diplomats, but the same thing is also true to some extent with the Central Intelligence Agency, that too many officials, if they stayed too long in a country, would lose, would not see the forest through the trees, would lose their understanding of what the American interests were, and artificially amplify local interests. And therefore, rather than have a cadre of experts, in terms of local society and language, we would have a cadre of generalists who could rotate around 
intelligence was seen as a so part of a social science as if the social science was actually scientific and had predictive value. Um, and ultimately, there, I mean, on one hand, we don't, we don't get the clientitis and the localitis the way we used to. But on the other hand, we may have blind spots because of that. Um, I'm also worried, I mean, one other issue, I'm going to come back to language in just a second, but as part of this tabula rasa, we can't have strategies that are geared to artificial four and eight year intervals of the American political calendar. And at the same time, we are guaranteed to lose until we restore a bipartisan consensus about what our national interests are. Everything has become a political football. And I don't think we can win a single war so long as Congress um, isn't on the same page as to what our national interests are, the way, frankly, they were generally during the Cold War. One other thing I'm worried about, you guys familiar with the Wind Talkers? The Navajos during World War II that got on the radio and, I mean, were able to speak and the Germans were never able to, or, um, or the Japanese to, to crack it? Frankly, I'm worried about a revert. I mean, our lack of linguistic ability makes me very worried about a reverse wind talker situation. And I'm not talking about Arabic or Persian or um, Chinese. I'm talking about some of the uh, smaller local dialects or languages in the Sahel of Africa. And you could study the languages of southern Chad and never be called on by the government, but darn it, we need someone who's willing to do that just in case. And I'm afraid we're at a real disadvantage there. All right, we have time for two more questions. I'm a sophomore and I'm majoring in not I'm majoring in political science and international global studies with a minor in criminal justice studies. And so you touched a little bit on it, Dr. Rubin, but in terms of US foreign policy, I feel like there's been this approach to nation build in the Middle East and democratize certain uh, parts of it. And it just doesn't seem like an effective way, but we continue, the U.S. continues to do that. So what would your, if you were to make an approach, what would your strategy be in combating human rights issues in the Middle East from a U.S. foreign policy stance? Okay, um, I would say that when we look at the Iraq or the Afghan war, oftentimes they're conflated, and I'm glad you didn't, because I really see three different issues. Number one is whether or not to go to war. Number two is whether or not to replace um, one dictator with another, or rather to try for democracy. And the third question is whether or not to engage in development and nation building. The reason why I don't, I, I, I mean, when it comes to Iraq and Afghanistan, and this might be controversial, I support the first two. Going to war for very specific reasons, and then trying for democracy. Um, in Iraq, according to the Guardian newspaper in, in the United Kingdom, in 2000, June 2002, they had an article that found that one out of every six Iraqis fled the country under Saddam Hussein, and when they went outside of Iraq, they had no cultural impediment to embracing democracy. That said, um, the, and, and the problem with our aid community is too often we gear the metric of success to amount of money spent. And I think that's a false metric. When I, I spent last December traveling around Lebanon, outside of Beirut, I mean, I went to the Northeast, the Southeast, the Southwest, I mean, basically everywhere but Beirut. And I came to the conclusion that $100,000 in a municipality in southern Lebanon would be much more effective than $10 million given to Beirut. Now, there's ways which during the Clinton administration and the George W. Bush administration, people recognize this, and you have the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which, if you guys don't know it, it's, it's a different way of doing foreign aid. It was an experimental way, but it was wildly successful, and it's still there, but I would argue that the aid mafia doesn't want the focus to be on it, because too many people are invested in the system as it is, which is dysfunctional. Um, when it comes to broader, when it comes to democratization, one thing you said is it hasn't really worked. But I would argue that 
relying on dictatorships hasn't really worked either, which is where I go back to what I said before, where there is no magic formula. When it comes to the human rights issues, one thing I would do is remove the ambassadors from determining where certain aid money gets spent. And this is controversial because in theory, the ambassador is supposed to be in charge of everything in the country, but the, amb and the ambassador also has to do business with the country. And so we saw Frank Riccardoni back in 2005 say to Egyptian students that Hosni Mubarak is so popular that he could even get elected in the United States. And at the same time, um, he was insisting that all aid be channeled through him in a way that wouldn't upset Hosni Mubarak's government. So let's give the ambassadors a little bit of plausible deniability. Okay, last question. So, <clears throat> phrasing, my name's Ariella. I'm a sophomore studying um, Stratcom and leadership. And to not sound, <clears throat> I guess, too bleak, um, to say that, start with, you have a lot of organizations in Israel, like Yad Vyad, the Eretz organization that provide aid for uh, Palestinians or institutions and schools that teach, you know, Palestinians and Israelis together in classrooms at a very young age. I guess my question is how how relevant do you think these organizations and institutions are and, you know, with what's going on in a greater conflict, are they actually going to be making, you know, a difference or a change in what would it take to make that? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I, I think going back down just to like the realist principles that the state of Israel doesn't have an incentive to cooperate. The state of Israel doesn't have an incentive to fix the issue. Because for them, they have all the cards. It's working well for them. But especially since the, the last time the data, there's minimal loss of life that's going on. You know, Hamas pops off some uh, rockets out of Gaza every once in a while, but for the most part, the status quo is working for them. So there, there's no real incentive to act up and sleep to change the status quo. Um, I guess that's even more bleak <laughs> than um, what you were going for. Do you have anything? Um, I, I would just add, I'm gonna take it to a government level. I mean, when I, I, I don't spend a lot of time in Israel. I might go once a decade. But I, I mean, I've been to places like Neves Shalom and so forth. And one of, from, one of the things that's frustrated me from a policy standpoint is the first Intifada started in 1987. And when it started, it was truly a <coughs> grassroots movement. And one of, the, one of the things that made it distinct was that many of the Palestinians who were fighting during that Intifada, they knew Hebrew. Um, they had either learned it in prison or they learned it from their interactions with Israelis. And by knowing Hebrew, they understood how Israelis thought. When it came to, uh, so the first Intifada ended, what, around 1990, and then you had the Oslo Accord, uh, Accords. And it, there was a debate within the Clinton administration at the time as to what to do. And while the Palestine Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, had been sent to Tunis in exile back in 1983, the Clinton administration decided to bring him back because the idea was it's easier to reach a deal with a dictator, with a single person, no matter how corrupt, no matter how fault he might be, than it would be with a grassroots movement. Now, hindsight's always 20, 20 but I do think, I mean, Yasser Arafat didn't understand Israeli society. He didn't understand the way Israelis thought. He had a different agenda at times than perhaps some of the grassroots Palestinians who were the backbone of that first intifada. And perhaps because the United States was mistaken, this is where we go to the previous question about democracy or dictatorship, <coughs> because we decided to go with a dictatorship in order to reach the symbolism of a deal and hope that this man would be able to deliver, we undercut what I think would have been a little bit more complicated, but would have led to um, some of that mutual interactions which have been highlighted and prioritized by Yad Vyad, and the or which I'm not familiar with, and the organizations which you cite. Okay. 
you guys have any further questions um, for Michael or Tom, they will be outside of the reception, so feel free to ask. There'll be some food and beverages for you guys. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Gil for uh, helping me. He is their programs associate. So thank you to him, and thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.